Greetings from the Petersburg Church of Christ. We thank you for allowing us into your home today, and we encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with the message that's presented today. We would also encourage you to take notes and send us any questions or comments that you have concerning today's message to the address that will be provided at the end of the lesson. We invite you to join us any opportunity that you have. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are located at 205 Russell Street, just off the south side of the Petersburg Square. Last Sunday morning, we gave a lesson we didn't get through on the subject of the temple of the living God. The temple in the Old Testament was a very interesting place. The temple was built on the mountain that Abraham offered Isaac on, Mount Moriah. The more I study this, the more I realize what a vast subject it is. If the material that I'm reading is true, and I believe it is, if the Bible is true, we're dealing with a subject that will make a difference in our lives as we live and where we spend eternity. In the eighth chapter of the book of First Kings, to get us back into this subject, There are many different places in the Bible where the temple is discussed. At 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Now drop on down to about verse 27. It says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servants prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. Those are profound words that are talking about the Old Testament temple, the house of the Lord. Now we saw last Sunday that the church in the New Testament was called the house of God. It was called the temple. It was the temple of the Old Testament that was built by David's son, Solomon. The church of the New Testament, the temple of the Lord, was built by God's Son, Jesus Christ. There were adversaries that had to be conquered before the Old Testament temple was built. We saw that in 1 Kings chapter 5. And as sure as there was a period of preparation for the Old Testament temple to be built, there was a period of preparation before the New Testament temple of the church could be built. John the Baptist came preparing the way for Jesus to come. He was a preparation figure. He was never in the kingdom, the temple. He died before it existed. 
Jesus was preparing for it. He sent the 70 out preparing for it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was a preparation ground before the temple, the kingdom, the church came on the day of Pentecost. There were adversaries that had to be conquered before the Old Testament temple could be built. The adversary of Satan and his threat of death had to be overcome and conquered before Jesus could build the church. You remember when Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church in the gates of hell? Other translations say the gates of the Hadean world. One translation puts it, the powers of death. Satan had the powers of death. Jesus took it away from him before he established the church. When he died on Calvary, and he was buried, and he arose three days later, he took death away from Satan. And then the church came into existence. The adversary of the devil, the threat of death, had to be overcome. The material of the Old Testament temple, that is the fir trees, the cedar trees, uh, different kinds of materials were prepared out of another country and brought over into Jerusalem where the temple was built. The material of the New Testament church, people who are made in the image of God, <clears throat> were prepared, they were taken out of the devil's kingdom. There's not but two spiritual kingdoms, the Lord's kingdom and the devil's kingdom. And people were taken out of that spiritual kingdom, the devil's kingdom, and brought over, Colossians 1.17 says, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Another interesting thing we saw last Sunday was that Solomon was on his throne ruling and reigning when he built the Old Testament temple. Jesus was ruling and reigning on David's throne, Acts chapter 2, when the temple was built, and has been ruling and reigning on David's throne throughout all of these years, and is still ruling and reigning. He's not going to begin that when he comes back, as the world believes. He's already doing so. Solomon's servants went into Tyre and reaped the goods that would go into the temple. When Jesus says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, the people who in every nation on earth were to be brought into the temple of Jesus Christ, his church. We saw a lot of things. We also talked about how that the materials were cut fit in another kingdom. And we quoted the verse, I believe it was First Kings 5, verse 7. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. Everything had been prepared just right. The stones fit together with no adjusting. The timbers fell in place with no sawing or cutting. Everything fit in its place. The king, the temple rose in silence in its construction. An interesting thought. When people hear the gospel, they obey it from the heart. That truth shapes and molds and fits them into the church. And if they don't fit when they come into the church, they didn't do something right. Did you ever know anybody like that? Oh, I've seen a lot of people through the years that no more had obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ than a man in the moon because they didn't fit when they came into the church. There was always a problem. 
It was trying to bring error, falsehoods, into the church. That's an interesting statement. We got down to the point we were going to make last Sunday. And this one is profound. In 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 9, been in the Bible all these years. It still says what it did a thousand years ago. It'll say this a thousand years from now. Notice what happened in King Hiram dealing with Solomon, bringing the materials into Jerusalem to make up the Old Testament temple. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea. And I will convey them by sea in floats unto the place that thou shalt appoint me. And will cause them to be discharged there, and thou shalt receive them, and thou shalt accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. Did you notice what that said? What is it that they were bringing down from Lebanon? <clears throat> the materials that would go into the temple. Specifically in verse 8, the timber of cedar and the timber of fir. These were materials that would go into the temple building that Solomon was having put together. How did they get there? Did you notice that little three-letter word? They came over by the sea. What's the sea? Water. They put the cedar logs together into a package, something like a, no doubt, a, a floating device. My mind has completely went blank on what you call that floating device. Uh, there's a name for it, but my, can, my, my mind won't, won't bring it up right now. This material came across water to get into the temple. Do you remember what Jesus said? Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What was it? Peter preached the household of Cornelius. And he commanded them in the name of the Lord to be baptized. The material that makes up the New Testament temple, the church, comes through water to come into it. That's interesting. I didn't write that, but you can't help but notice it. And there's a lot more that needs to be said. The uh, Old Testament temple was very beautiful. This is established on 1 Kings 6, 20 through 22, on down through verse 30. We won't take time to read it. But you know what most of the temple was coated with? It's called gold. The exact weight measurements of the gold is given in the Bible that was overlaid on the cedar boards and some of the columns that made up the Old Testament temple. The verse that really got my attention was Isaiah 64 at verse 11. Listen to this. Let's start at verse 9. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house 
where our fathers praise thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Here the Bible says that this Old Testament temple was a beautiful house. And did you notice in the very same breath of inspiration that called it a, our beautiful house where our fathers praised thee? You know what happened to that Old Testament temple? It was burnt with fire. It burned up. It was destroyed. Now, when you get into the Bible subjects, before you know it, you're in over your head, and you begin to swim, and you begin to think, and you begin to try to figure this thing out. The Old Testament temple was a physical structure. Fire could destroy it, and it did. The temple that we are reading about today in our world reference works and our international standard bible encyclopedias some of the comments that are made in some of these books are quite interesting and quite befuddling and you begin to think well what's he talking about well the old testament temple that solomon built was burnt with fire it was destroyed you remember Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of the city of Jerusalem? Do you know who the people were that rebuilt the Old Testament temple? His name was Zerubbabel. You think I'm kidding? No, I'm not kidding. The book of Haggai has two chapters in it. Do you know what is being petitioned to be done in the two chapters of the book of Haggai? To rebuild the Old Testament temple. Oh, you've got to be kidding, Brother Burton. No, I'm not. Listen to it. At verse, in verse 1 and 2 of Haggai 1, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the times that the Lord's house should be built. Going a little further. Verse 4. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to be put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Do you know what goes on if you'll read the whole book of Haggai? The Old Testament temple had been destroyed. It had been burnt. And the admonition is to the prophet Haggai to encourage a rubble to rebuild the Old Testament temple. And you can't read chapter 2 and not realize that this is exactly what is going on. In chapter 2, verse 3, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josetek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. 
According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Well, thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will make I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And a couple other verses make reference to the stones of the Old Testament temple. Well, what's going on in Haggai? The comparison being made in the gold-centered purpose for them to rebuild the Old Testament temple. Then they did it. And in the context of this chapter here, of chapters 1 and 2 of Haggai, he's comparing the glory of the former temple with the one that would be rebuilt. And in this prophecy, he's shooting to the future when the temple of God, the temple of the church, would be built. You want an exact fulfillment of Haggai 2, verse 9, Ephesians chapter 2, 12 through 22, and guess what 12 through 22 is talking about? The temple, the church, where the Jew and the Gentile could be reconciled together. And in the passage of Ephesians 2, it says that peace would be preached. Well, what did Haggai 2 verse 9 say? He said, in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. In the immediate context, Peace would be given in the Old Testament temple that would be rebuilt after the first one. And the far-reaching truth that the peace of Jesus, he is our peace, Ephesians 2 says. Peace was to be preached. The peace that would come between the conflict between the Jew and the Gentile would come about in the church. All this is profound. The more you study this subject, the more you realize you've gotten yourself into one more topic. But let me uh, wind down and give you some, something else to think about. As sure as the Old Testament temple was built out of stones and it supported the walls, it supported the floor timbers, as sure as those stones were fit together. And you know who put those together, don't you? Where did Solomon get his blueprint? Got it from the Lord. Where do we get the blueprint for the church? Alexander Campbell? Afraid not. Church fathers of 200 years ago? No. Where is the blueprint, the pattern for the church? New Testament. Jesus is its head. I'm not. You're not. Nobody else is. Who said, I'll build it? Jesus did. He said, I'll build it. Whose name does it wear? It wears the name of Jesus. Whose will does it obey? The will of Jesus. How do we worship the way Jesus said to worship, in spirit and in truth? You worship any other way, you might as well stay at home. Because it won't work. Oh, there's so much in this topic that we could talk about it for a long time. But you may have a minute ago, I read two verses in 1 Kings 10, about verse 8, rather, chapter 8. And you remember what those verses said? It said, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. What was it that was in the Old Testament temple? 
glory of the Lord, the glorification of Jehovah God. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16? He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know the only place you can glorify God? Ephesians 3, verse 21. What does it say? Unto him be glory in the church, world without end, throughout all ages. Where do we glorify God? In church. In the churches of men? No. In the church we bat and bat. It's the only place you can glorify God. The Old Testament temple was full of the glory of the Lord. The New Testament church must be full of the glory of the Lord. Too many men are seeking renowned positions. Look what I have accomplished in the church today. How many preachers are guilty of that? How many of us need to drop our heads in sincere repentance and prayer and give God the glory? Too many people are tooting their own horns. Too many people are bragging about what they have accomplished. They're not giving the glory to God. And if they don't give it the glory to God, they might as well not do it because it's not worth two cents. Unto him be glory in church. There's something else that's quite interesting. We, we read the passage there on the end of the 8th chapter. What were these people doing in the Old Testament temple? I read from about verse 27 through verse 30. I remember watching the news a few years ago when Ronald Reagan was inaugurated president of the United States. Do you know what passage was read at his inaugural address? Second Chronicles 7, 11 through 16. And I thought, crude, why in the world would a politician read a passage like that at an inauguration? It's a cousin passage to 1 Kings 8 that we read here earlier. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, temple of the Lord had just been finished, verse 11, 12, and then it makes the statement concerning the prayers prayed in the Old Testament temple would be heard by God. You know the only place you can pray to God that would do you any good? In the temple of the Lord. The Old Testament temple served its purpose. The New Testament temple of the church is still in existence. I'm afraid we have lost a whole lot of knowledge of what the Bible has to say about the temple. The Old Testament temple was destroyed. It was rebuilt. The Old Testament temple gave way to the temple of the living God, the church, you find in the New Testament. Have you ever heard any thoughts about the marriage supper of the Lamb? When's it going to happen? When time shall be no more. What's going to happen at the marriage supper of the Lamb? The church, the bride of Christ, is going to be finally united with King Jesus forevermore in the expanses of eternity. 
the temple that we are members of in this life, the bride of Christ, will serve its purpose. We'll die and we'll leave this world or he'll come back in the resurrection morning and the whole thing will be gone. Then the marriage supper of the Lamb. The celebration spiritually of people who have been in the temple of God finally consummated in that gathering of Jesus Christ and his people. Something to think about. All these other things that need to be said, time to call. I hope you have been caused to study this for yourself. I do not claim to be an authority on the Bible. I know a little bit, been studying a long time, but I'm still learning things that I should have learned a long time ago. But you can't study the temple of the Old Testament and not recognize it foreshadowed the temple of God, the church, in the New Testament. And it gave way to that organization. Somebody says, well, that's all the churches of men. I'm afraid not. Mm -mm. Because if they were the temple of the Lord, then they would honor the authority of King Jesus. They would be teaching the plan of salvation that Jesus taught. They don't teach it. They would be worshiping like Jesus said worship, and they don't worship like Jesus said worship. They've got every kind of idea and false doctrine floating all over this world that is not in agreement with what the New Testament teaches. When Jesus said, I will build my church, he meant exactly what he said. And he did it. And it has been in existence on the face of the earth ever since the day of Pentecost somewhere. I still believe the Bible teaches we preach Christ in the church. You can't leave it out. You become a false doctor, a false teacher if you do. But this Jesus only doctrine that's being pushed by a lot of our brethren today is as full of denominational false teaching as anything you'll ever read. You can't preach Christ and leave the church out. Jesus didn't do it. Apostle Paul didn't do it. Peter didn't do it. When you quit preaching the church, you just went down to you. You just gave up your hope in Christ. I'm not going to give it up. I'm not going to quit preaching what the Bible says about the church. It's important. The temple of God, the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of you're not a Christian. You're not a citizen of that kingdom. If you're not in that temple, we plead with you. Do something about it. Obey the gospel of Christ. Come into him where all spiritual blessings are. We can help you in any way. You need to come back. If you've fallen away, you've given up your hope in the church. You need to realize what's happened to you. He didn't leave you, you left him. You need to come back to it. Would you come while we stand together? If you have questions or comments concerning today's lesson, you may send those to Petersburg Church of Christ, 205 Russell Street, Petersburg, Tennessee, 37144. Or you may email us at Petersburg Church of Christ at hotmail.com. You may also request a copy of today's lesson through the same method. Be sure to include today's date along with the station on which this program aired and the title of the lesson. We hope to see you again next week right here on this station at the same time.